like to ask you to take out your Bible and turn to Psalm 121. We have just asked the Lord to speak to us through His Word. If you don't have an outline, lift your hand, and there are some great folks that will be glad to hand one to you in our church. We study the Bible, and as we do, we seek to help you with that a little bit by making it available in an outline so you can take it home with you. In fact, if you're clicking and uh, watching online, there is a link below this video where you can download the notes and be able to follow right along as we go. Last week, we looked at Psalm 19. Many of you were encouraged by looking at the glorious picture, and the, the Word of God is our revival. Bring, he brings revival through His Word to our hearts. And this morning, we come to the security of God, not just the glory of God of, of Psalm 19, but this morning we come to look at the security of God's people. You know, it's interesting, the word security is an important word in this present day and time. It's kind of um, strange how safety um, through the 1970s and 80s became very important, um, OSHA came into full swing during the 70s and 80s. Many of you would recognize that rules changed in the workplace that were requiring greater safety. And I remember I expected that on construction sites where you couldn't just have steel sticking up. You had to cap the steel. You had to reduce the risk. Um, some of you guys know all about that. But I remember OSHA started making its way even into the offices and, uh, you know, desks have to be at the right height so you're not creating back problems and arm problems and shoulder problems and, and all those kinds of things. Security and safety and, and welfare, caring for one another, um, is an important part of the world that we live in. And uh, whether by government or by legal things, we often think about our well-being. Well, we also think about far beyond just employment safety and so forth. We we look at other areas of security. Many of you have an alarm system in your house. Many of you have an alarm system on your car, seeking to bring some, some element of security from those who would seek to, to be thieves, that, 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 that would come and take the things that you have. We have computer security in order to protect those who make it their ways through the wires into our information and into all that we have that is there, cyber security. We have health safety issues. My daughter is a nurse at Joe DiMaggio, and she said it's just amazing the checks and double checks and triple checks before we administer medicine and the systems that are in place that are very, very elaborate and very complicated to try to bring safety um, in these areas. We talk about national safety and national security. In fact, there's great debate even today. We have people in our church that have not received paychecks checks because of an argument over national security. Um, wherever you stand on that, the issue is before us. And we see these kinds of things that are very much on our minds, not, not just national security, but also economic security. So there's elaborate mechanisms in place to seek to provide these kinds of security around us. We, if I see another ad by William Devane in Roslyn Capital, I might, I don't know what I'll do. Um, but, you know, he talks about uh, your financial security and what's in your bank and what's in your safe and, and all of these kinds of things. The, the issue of security is huge in our present day and time. I want us to look this morning at the very real issue of God's people and his security over his people. You see, this is timely because we come into 2019, and it's interesting for all of our technology and all of our development and all of our forward progress, it seems that there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about many of these areas that we've just mentioned. This is a natural concern for humans. It's a natural concern that we have to deal with both the things of malice and the things of natural occurrence the things that are imaginable and the things that are unimaginable to us. And before we throw away the concerns of security, I dare any of you to leave your front door open at night. 
Um, you know, some people say, oh, come on, just trust God. Does that mean leave your front door open at night? No, that doesn't. Occasionally, Marcy will get on to me because I'll be out in the garage and I'll do something and we'll wake up in the morning, go downstairs and the garage door's open. And um, my neighbor even called me while I was on vacation one time and said, uh, Pastor, do you mean to have your garage door open? It's been three days. And I'm like, oh, uh, Mr. Salinas, please close the garage door. So um, hopefully you're not as forgetful sometimes as I am about that kind of thing. But we do think about it, and I thank the God of heaven that he is not forgetful concerning his people. Notice here with me Psalm 121 and the security of God's people. There are three critically important concepts I want you to get right here before we read the, before we read the passage. And they are on your outline and they're on the screen as well in front of you. Throughout God's word, we see that God is moving his people to look beyond the things that are seen to the things that are unseen. From creation, fall, redemption, and the picture of his restoration, the whole biblical story is God helping us to look to him beyond what we see in this earthly life. It's not saying that the things of this life are not real. It's not saying that the physical aspect around us is not real or that it's not important. It's just not real important. It's real and it's important, but it's not the most important. In fact, as we really look at the Scripture and as we really study the Bible, we see that God is busy at work showing us what He is really all about when it comes to the physical versus the spiritual realm. And so notice this with me. It's the things that are unseen um, are the things that are very much on God's heart. It's helping us look from the physical to the spiritual. You can fill that in. The physical to the spiritual. This is a massive part of what we see throughout the Old Testament narrative. In fact, when God calls Samuel to go and anoint the new king, one of Jesse's sons, he sees all of Jesse's strong sons and he says, is this it because God's, not, God's man is not here? And they said, oh, well, we have a little shepherd boy that's out in the field. Somebody go get David. And David comes in before him and the Lord gives to Samuel a pretty good picture of this by saying to him, you look on the outside, but I look on the inside. You see, the physical in front of us is often the most important thing that we see. When God is saying the spiritual aspect of all that he has designed is really what is on his mind and his heart. It's the temporary versus the, the eternal. God is calling us to look from the temporary into the eternal. And that brings us from the present into the future. God is always looking and promising and holding out the great hope for us that is in his future. And so this is a fundamental thing for both Christians to understand, and some of you are new to us. Some of you are just kind of figuring out. You, you feel like God has been drawing you to come to church, so you've been coming, you've been studying the Bible with us some, you've been listening to the gospel some, and as that's been happening, you're starting to, to learn a bit. We want to we help you re a great deal right now at this moment by saying much of what we see in the Bible is seeking to shift our focus from this earthly present life where we are right here to looking heavenward toward God, looking e toward eternity of what God has designed that takes us beyond the fallen world that we're in right now. Notice the next statement that is here. This can only happen through repentance toward God in faith in what he has said. So if you want to see the things that God calls us to see in eternity, we have to turn from ourselves and look to him. We have to turn from our way and turn to his way. And as we turn from ourselves and our way to him and to his way, we come to that by faith because it may not be readily apparent in front of us. This requires us to trust in him in what we cannot necessarily see. Now last Sunday we looked at the issue of Old Testament 
poetry and this beautiful picture of how God uses poetry throughout. It's a key genre throughout the Old Testament, and we see that the beautiful way, we, we, we unfortunately can't hear it in Hebrew because we don't all speak Hebrew. If we did, it would sound even that much more beautiful and that much more poetic, but just because it doesn't rhyme doesn't mean there is not tremendous beauty in God's poetry, and we've been looking at that. We've been looking at the progression of statements that are made and the usage of words and the usage of meaning and different semantics that we start to see that this is a, a beautiful structure, and we see that in Psalm 19 from last week, and we see that even in Psalm 121, and you'll pick up on hints of that today as we look at that. But notice here the third point that I want you to see, critically important. So first of all, God is calling us to go from the seen to the unseen, and he's calling us to look at what is the intricacy of his word. But this psalm, Psalm 121, is exclusively for God's people. The promises that are here are for his own. These promises are not for the world that does not know him, but only for the people who do know him. And so we, we, we want to see this through the lens of God's children. We want to see this through the lens of God's people. Now, this is especially evident in verse 4, right in the middle of this psalm. So if you would, take your pen and circle the word Israel in verse 4, because that is, that is naming who this is. And who is Israel? Right out there to the side of what you just circled, God's people, because this is all about God's people. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither, sleep, no, will neither slumber nor sleep. So let's read the psalm, and uh, you follow along there. You see it in four sections, and these are absolutely beautiful. Number one, verse one. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Verse three. He will not let your foot be moved. He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He, the Lord will keep your going out and your go, coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This last Tuesday, I shared this psalm with our church staff, and um, along with a devotional from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And we just kind of rallied around this truth, this beautiful promise of, of God's security for his people. We were looking at the fact that, yes, we know that things physically happen to us, but this is talking about the things that are really in God's economy of scale, and God's economy of of importance, which is talking about the spiritual nature of our lives, the spiritual nature of his children. Yes, indeed, we live in a fallen world where there is pain, where there is hardship, where there is struggle, but God is saying, for my people, my deliverance is beyond the things of this earthly life that are so painful and so hurtful. We, as a church staff, we talk talk about each Sunday, or excuse me, each Tuesday, we, we talk about not only the programs and all the things that we're working on in the organization of the church, but we're talking about your struggles. We're talking about your hardships. We're talking about not just health things, but other uh, difficulties that come into our lives. And we're praying for these things very often. And we're thinking about our own lives as a church staff. And as we, as we looked at this, Pastor Lucas just reminded us that the very lady who passed away in the middle of the week after we had looked at this passage said this was Louise Riley's favorite psalm. So the woman who passed away this last week, her favorite psalm was Psalm 121. And I said, that's amazing. In fact, Jack, her husband, took off his ring. He took off his ring and he showed it to me. And on the inside of both of their wedding bands, it says Psalm 121. Isn't that cool? This is a beautiful, beautiful promise to God's children that he takes care of his own. And there is a security that his people enjoy that no one else could ever enjoy that do not know the sovereign king of the universe who have been purchased by his blood and who are called his own. 
So I want us to see this beautiful picture. I want us to see this and break it down for just a few moments. And I, and I pray that as you go into 2019, as you look at your present life now, and as you think about, I'm going to even say it, as you think about your death, that you would begin to take all of this into the consideration of God's grand promises and his great security that he gives to his children. I really like John MacArthur's outline of this, so I've included it at the top so you can see. And it's very plain. It's very simple. And um, notice what he says in Roman numeral number one where it says, God, this is God our helper. Look at verses one and two. God our helper. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The word help is used twice there in that section of prose or in this section of poetry. Notice what it says. Help, where does my help come from? And then he answers the question that is asked in verse one. In verse two, he says, my help comes from the Lord. He's not depending on someone else. He's not depending on um, someone around him. He's not depending on upon um, anything that he owns. He is depending upon the Lord. Now, it's interesting. It says in verse 1, I lift up my eyes to the hills. We, we quite honestly don't know exactly what that means. It could mean one of two things. Either he is ascending toward Jerusalem. This is a song of ascents, the idea of possibly heading to Jerusalem to worship. There's about 15 psalms that are the songs uh, of ascent, that are the poems of ascent, heading to Jerusalem to worship. So it could be that he's looking toward the high place of Jerusalem as opposed to the low uh, wilderness areas that are around it, and and he's looking at going to worship. Or it could be that he's looking into the hills and he's saying, I have to cross these hills, and sometimes when you look at the Middle East and when you look at ancient days, when you went into hilly areas, you were a little bit more vulnerable. You, you, you're heading there, and maybe it's not only difficult to climb some of those hills, but people can hide in hills, right? When you're out on the plain, you can see them coming and get ready. But when you're in the hills, you can't necessarily see them coming and get ready. And so whether it's, whether it's the blessing of worship that they're headed to or whether it's the peril that is in front of them, we say that their question is, where does the help come from? And we see very solidly that he's saying, my help comes from the Lord. Uh, look at number two with me. God, our keeper. And we're going to see the word keep is used five times, not just in verses three and four, but also in five and six and seven. So look with me, and it says in verse three and four, God, our keeper. Look at verse three. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who what? Keeps Israel, keeps his people, will neither slumber nor sleep. So God is our keeper. Number three, God is our protector. Fill that in. God is our protector. Five and six. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. So he is your protector. The idea of shade is the idea of shielding or shade. On your right hand, the sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. We'll look at that in just a moment. So he's, he is your protector. And we also see as part of God's security at the very end of the psalm, the last section of poetry is God, our preserver, our preserver. You say, is that a word, a preserver? Why don't you just say preservative? Well, uh, a preservative is a substance. A preserver is perhaps a person or something that has a function that is in that that is used a little bit differently. In fact, as a kid growing up, we had these orange things that I had to wear every time I was, we were in the boat. Dad would say, put on your life, what? Preserver. So the idea is, if Andy goes overboard, he's not going to drown. The idea is, this will help preserve his life. So we we see that God is the helper, the keeper, the protector, the preserver. Let's unpack this a little bit more. In verse 1 and 2, I want you to notice something here. Verse 1 and 2 is different than 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 and 8. And here is this beautiful difference. Notice that in verse 1 and 2, it is very, very personal. It's in the first person. He says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? 
In verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, this is very personal, but it turns through the rest of it in 3 through 8 to become a voice to those that are around the psalmist, the voice to the one who is listening. Look what he says in verse 3. He says, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither neither sleep nor slumber. Look at verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. The sun will not strike you by day by day or the moon by night. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. So we see in verse 1 and 2 that this is a very personal thing. I want you to fill this in. God typically does a work in us before he does a work through us. So from personal experience, the, the perspective is given in this psalm that the Lord is my help, and because I know him to be my help, I can, I can tell you who he can be to you too. Because from my personal experience, I can share with you what God has done in me so that he too can do it in you. That's very often how God does work. There's some people who just say, well, I just want God to use me. I just want God to use me. I just want God to use me. And they're not interested in listening to what he wants to do in them first. Very often, we'll be praying about something that we think we, we want God to use us to do when sometimes God is saying, well, wait a minute, settle down, come be with me first. Why don't you settle down and listen? You know, very often when you begin to really pray about something, you got this thing in your life or you got you, even an opportunity or may a problem, maybe a problem, and you really start focusing on that and you, you get down to really pray about it, and the Lord keeps bringing up other things. Well, it's funny that he may be using that issue to get your attention on other things that he wants to do in order to draw you near to him. And that's just the way our God works because he is so gloriously relational. He would much rather have you near to him than have you running afar off and doing, being very busy about him. So um, we see that this is a very personal approach. Not only is it very personal and God doing a work in us, but we also want to see and notice here that God's help to this person, God's help to this one who is saying, the Lord is my helper, has unlimited power. Fill that in. Notice what he says in verse 2. In fact, would you all read verse 2 out loud together with me? Are you ready? Verse 2, let's read it. My help comes from the Lord. Who what? He made heaven and earth. And so this is the God of creative power. This is the God of creation power. This is the God who speaks and worlds come into being. This is the God who by his word and by his will, things exist. And so if this is the God who helps you, this is the God of unlimited power. Um, as Christian missionaries going to the world of Islam, um, there's often a struggle as you're seeking to talk to Muslims about God because they believe that their view of God is the one true God and that there is no other God, and they believe that the Christian and the Jewish God is, a, is, is not a pure view of who God really is. They, they, they believe that it's a different God. And so when they talk about God, they say, oh, no, you know, we believe in the one true God. And I say, well, you know, I do too. Um, but what I learned quickly as I would begin to talk with Muslims about God is I didn't usually use the word God. I didn't usually use the word Lord. I would very often, when I was beginning a conversation with a Muslim, I would say le createur. In French, you would say the creator or le createur. And so when I would say, well, you know, I believe in the creator, they would go, oh, really? Me too. I believe in the Creator too because they believe that God created. And part of the reason that they don't think that we as Christians truly believe in that because they have watched so much Western culture deny God as Creator. So much culture has so embraced Darwinianism and so embraced the whole evolutionary theory and so embraced a, a non-view of God as Creator God that the Muslims say, you don't even know who God is because you don't believe He created things. 
And I say, oh, no, 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 friend. Actually, I do. In fact, I, I call him le Creator. I call him the God who made heaven and earth and all things. And then they start saying, well, maybe we're, maybe we're talking about the same idea of God. And I say, well, indeed, perhaps we are. And then we begin to look at the true scripture of what it says of who God is and who God is not, which is a different God from them, but the, certainly the creator God. So this is the God of unlimited power, the maker of of heaven and earth. So when you think about your problems, when you think about the one it, that is your help, if indeed you are one of the children of God calling upon his name, this is the God of ultimate power. Verse 3 and 4. We see an interesting fa- phrase here in verse 3 and 4, and it talks about this, the foot being moved, or your foot not being moved. He will not let your foot be moved. This is the idea of it being slipped. You place it in one place, but suddenly it's not in the same place. It slips, and it throws you off balance. You say, well, my foot was there, and then it's not. And so I, 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 I trip or I stumble in this way. What's interesting about this is, is that the phrase that is used here is not talking about physical falling, but instead a divine judgment or a a spiritual destruction, a slipping out of God's care, a slipping out of his protection. And so here's the picture the psalmist is wanting us to see and wanting us to sing. Look at what it says in verse 3. He will not let you be lost. He will not let you fall in regard to his salvation. He who keeps you will not slumber. God is not going to fall asleep on you, protecting you. But you see... Where some of the trouble comes in is when even present-day Christians are looking at the present life around them and experiencing the the struggles and the pains of life, and they immediately begin to think, well, these troubles are coming upon me. God must not be watching. And what we fail to sometimes remember is the grand picture of creation, fall. We've fallen as 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 a complete human race out of the beautiful plan of God when it comes to our innocence before him, we've embraced sin. And so as a result of that, there are all kinds of terrors and troubles that come our way. But the continuation of the story is not just that we're in the fall, but we are in his redemption. He is bringing about a redemption for his people, and he is saving them out of this great struggle. And that is what this psalm is talking about. It's not saying that you're never going to experience the troubles and the struggles of this life. It is saying that he has a salvation that will never lose its footing. Look what it says in verse 4, and it's referring to his people, and it's, again, the progressive repeat that we looked at last, last week. He who, behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber or sleep. Now, I've seen things written that say, well, the first one in verse 3 says he will not slumber, and then in verse 4, you know, that's like a cat nap. In verse 4, he will, never, he, he will not slumber nor sleep. You know, sleep is a deeper type of sleep. None of that's true in the Hebrew. It's two different words for sleeping. It's two different words for not paying attention. It's two different words for being inattentive and perhaps going into rest. And so what the point is here, in the poetic form, it's using both terms, and it's saying, however you slice it, God is not going to leave you hanging. God is going to see you. He knows what's happening. It may not seem like he does because of your physical experiences around you, but if you are his child, he sees you, he knows what's going on. Now, we see that truth throughout the stories of the Old Testament. You go read the stories of the Old Testament, God is always aware. God is always looking at his people. He's looking at Joseph. He's looking at Moses. He's looking at David. He's looking at Gideon. He's looking at Daniel. He knows what they're going to. He knows what Rahab is going through. He sees where she is. He sees what's happening. And he clearly knows what his plan is. And so part of this psalm is to help us see that he sees the big picture. He's got my salvation in his hand, and he never falls asleep. So fill this in. God is always watching and working. We can rest through the narrative of Scripture. You can see throughout the Old Testament 
and throughout the New Testament, God is always watching and he's always working and that's what Psalm 121 in part is trying to say to us. Now look at verses five and six. Verse five and six is talking about the fact that God shields his people from the greatest threats offered by a hostile and fallen world. And the greatest threats offered by a hostile and fallen world are not physical harm, but spiritual harm. The greatest threat that could come to you is that you would not be right with God. In fact, Jesus said, do not fear the people around you that once they've killed you, they've done all that they can do. Instead, fear the one that after he's killed you can throw you into hell. And so that's just plain speak of the Lord Jesus Christ showing us the big picture of what it is with God, to know the salvation of God, to know who is the right one to fear. We don't need to fear the, the acceptance or the rejection of man around us, of people around us. Instead, we come to look to God. So he is the shield in this. Now, it's very interesting the way it says this. Look in verse 5. It says, the Lord is your keeper. Uh, he is your protector. And here it is. He's saying, the Lord is your shade. The other idea is here, your shield on your right hand. And then here's the example in verse 6 and 7. It talks about the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. At the beginning of this message, perhaps you saw what this image is um, behind you, and I, I meant to draw this attention to, you, to your attention a little bit. Thank you, Alex. Um, where this is coming from, when we look at the Middle East and we look at the, the environmental aspect of the Bible, you see, the average person in that day and time, they knew very well the dangers of the sun. They lived in, a peri in an area where there are deserts, numerous different wilderness deserts all around. And I have gone and I have walked through the Judean wilderness. Um, I've walked through areas of Sinai wilderness. I've walked through various places that there's, there's no water in, in many, many miles aw away. And, and, and it's really intense because the, the humidity is so low and the sky is so clear. And if there's not wind where there's not dust in the air, the sun is incredibly intense. And then the heat rises. And so in the middle of the day, if you are there without shelter and without shade and without hydration, within just a matter of a few hours, the human body will die. When you go down into the Judean wilderness, it's very common for the temperatures to rise to 115, 120, 125 degrees. Um, we have colleagues that serve in areas of the Middle East where it commonly gets to be 120 degrees in their town. And very often, they don't have air conditioning. There's not enough electricity to support that. All the homes have tile floors or concrete floors. And in the heat of the day, in those dip, most difficult months, they will take a bucket of water and throw it out across the floor of the living room, and then they go lay down in the water as the evaporation cools them. And everybody just is very quiet and very still during the heat of the day. Literally happens. It's the way that they very often people survive. You see, the writer of this is saying... One of the greatest dangers that we could know and that most people would understand is the hostility of the, the summer heat and the hostility of the sun that can take your life. And then we also see this. He, the, the sun shall not strike you by day. Curious, the moon by night. Now, commentators would say, well, there's two different possibilities on that typically recognized. The first one, you say, well, the moon doesn't make you hot. The moon doesn't do that. No, but it can represent cold. You see, in desert areas, it can get very hot, and it can also get very cold. In the wintertime, it can be extremely cold in desert areas. And if you don't have shelter, you can even die of hypothermia. So here, the reality of that. But there's also, have you ever heard the idea of a lunatic? What is the word for moon in Spanish? Luna, a lunatic. These are the people who come out at night that are a little crazy. You don't see them during the day, but then they come out at night. And they're the people who, who do all kinds of things. I mean, you know, you go to Miami, go to New York City, go to Paris, go to Cairo, whatever. You go to the big cities and they come out at night. They're dangerous. 
They're strange. They're unpredictable. It's kind of hard to trace because it's night, and you don't even know what they're up to. And so part of the picture may be here that it's not only the, the physical elements of the world that can take you, but the malicious elements of the human heart that can take you. Whatever it may be, the picture of verse 5 and 6 is, is that the Lord is your protector, whether by physical or whether by the physical natural world around you or whether by human malice, God our protector. Look at 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from evil, all evil. He will keep your life. So this is where we really see the thing boiled down to the fact that he's going after the preservation of your very soul. Verse 7 and 8 is this. Fill it in. It is God's perfect preservation through his Messiah, Christ Jesus. It's through his Messiah, Christ Jesus, that sees his people all the way through the earthly struggles to eternity with him. That is the picture that is here in verse 7 and 8, that is an ultimate salvation, that he's protecting you from the evil that would take you to hell. He's protecting from the evil that even after you've become one of God's children, been forgiven of your sins, that still would love to come and snatch you out of the Father's hand, come and snatch you out of the salvation of God. In verse 7 it's saying, the Lord will keep you from all evil because you're his, that's the idea. He will keep your life. He will preserve you. Verse 8, the, notice this, don't miss it. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in and all that you do from this time forth. And then look what it says at the end. What does it say at the end? And what? Right eternity underneath that. You see, this is the salvation of God. The salvation of God is not about just this earthly life. The salvation of God is far grander. It's about eternity. Jesus said, anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so yesterday, we had a table beautifully set right here with Louise's pictures on it um, and celebrating her life and a funeral. By the way, if you've not discovered how joyful it is to go to Christian funerals, you need to get with the program. And what I mean by that is I... You know, sometimes we think, oh, a funeral, that's sad, and it's kind of difficult, and da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, we just think, I, I, I don't want to think about the loss and so forth. No. For funerals with Christians, they're a blast. You know why? Because we get to hear all about their life. We get to hear about their faith and what God has done in them and through them. We get, and you know, usually we talk about all the good things, so it's even better. So, you know, you know you don't, you're not wading through all the other stuff. But we get to celebrate the truths of what God has done in them. And that, that's so encouraging. And so what we see is, is that while we recognize that Louise is no longer with us, she, her struggle with the hostility of this earthly world is over. She no longer struggles with her, with her sin. She no longer struggles with, good night, her husband Jack. She no longer struggles with, with I mean, all of the things that are around her that were so painful, when, especially when she, she struggled for 30 years with a disease, debilitating disease. And let me tell you that when you think about the salvation of God, that she is safely home and forevermore she will enjoy all of the promises that God made to her. This is a glorious security. Flip the sheet. I want you to see this with me that this beautiful, glorious security is an eternal security for God's people. This is not a temporary thing. This isn't until the nine-volt battery dies in your alarm system at your house that you're protected, you know? This is, this is the, the full security of eternity that God gives. And I just want you to see a few of these verses. We're going to blast through them very quickly. And uh, I want you to see this. So fill that in. See the eternal security of God's people. A few months ago, or actually over a year ago, we studied the little letter of Jude. And if you've never studied that, you weren't here with us at Sheridan Hills during that time, I encourage you to go read that. It's right next to the book of Revelation. It's right at the end of the New Testament. And it's just this glorious warning level letter. It's, a, it's only 24 verses long. And it warns you 
that the apostates not only were coming, but now the apostates are here. These are the people who deny Christ, who they say that they know Christ, but they don't know Christ. And so these are the people um, that, that are now preaching the gospel for all the wrong reasons. They're preaching the gospel to get rich. They're preaching the gospel for sexual gratification. They're preaching the gospel for status and power. And, and they're preaching the gospel for all kinds of sordid reasons and sordid gain. They're preaching Christ for themselves. And so Jesus is saying, come and see that you don't have to do that. You don't have to go that route. In fact, be warned that you not, and at the end of that little letter, warning um, about the Christians that were the deserters. Look what it says. Now tempt to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless for the presence of his glory with great joy. This is, this is right at the end, a little doxology, verse 24 and verse 25, where he's saying, Jesus can eternally secure you all the way to the end. To him be praise and to be honor and to be glory. You see, this is the picture of his empowering of the perseverance of the saints. The idea that if you're really a Christian, you're going to remain with Christ to the end. The picture that he comes, he's able to sustain your faith and to help you be true to him to the end. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless. You see, that's salvation. To present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. The Lord Jesus would say these words and put out there the side, Jesus speaking. John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. Look what it says. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of, the, of him who sent me. Look what it says in verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Jesus isn't going to lose anything that the Father has given him. But raise it up on the last day. He's talking about people his followers. He's going to raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should what? Should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Look at John 10, 27 through 29, Jesus speaking again. He says, my sheep, you see, this is talking about his people. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life, and they will what? Never. Never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You see, this is eternal security. God, your keeper. God, your protector. Verse 29, my father has given them to me, my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, I love that, and no one is, an, is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, friends, God is saying to us, I want you to be secure in my salvation. He doesn't call it our salvation. He calls it his salvation. So as long as we come into his salvation, we're safe. We're not saving ourselves. We're not being saved by anyone else. We're coming to the Father so that we can rejoice in his salvation, that we are securely in his hand. The Apostle Paul would write these words in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Here again, physical versus the spiritual. So many Christians are struggling with their walk with God because they're just focusing on the physical, the physical, the physical, the physical, the circumstances of life, instead of listening to what the Father says and remembering all the promises He has made. And so, look what He's saying here. We do not lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And whether that, this light momentary affliction is persecution, I mean, some persecution can be pretty hard. I mean, we have Christians that have, have been torturously executed. And you say, that doesn't sound like very light momentary affliction. 
But see, it doesn't sound like that at first when, when you think about Christians sitting in prison. I think about Marie Durand in southern France sitting in prison for 37 years because she believed in Jesus. That didn't seem like a light momentary affliction being in the tour, the Agu de Mort. It was, it was a difficult, difficult life that she had had a path that, that God had for her. But when you compare Marie Durand's 37 years to the billions and billions of years of eternity with God, this is a light momentary affliction. We, we come to see things in the grand scale of God's eternity. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Look in the middle of the passage. As we look not to the things that are what? seen, but to the things that are what? Unseen. Unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, and the things that are unseen are what? Eternal. Oh, church, that we would we would begin to look at all of our decisions in life and all of the issues around us through the lens of eternity, that I would do that, that you would do that, that we would do that together, that we would begin to see the grand promises that God has made in the grand calling. I couldn't finish the sermon without reading Romans 8, 35 through 39. If you're new to the faith or if you're new to Christianity, I just want you to see that these are some of the most golden verses in all of Scripture that, that passionately show us that yes, in this earthly life we're going to have struggles, but he who has called us is faithful, as Hebrews 10 says. He who has called us is faithful, and he will bring it to pass. I want you to see this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or prostate cancer, or breast cancer, or car wrecks, or financial trouble? Who, what, what is going to separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. This is how the world looks at the children of God. But look at this in verse 37. No. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the security of God. This is the security that God gives to his people. It doesn't get any clearer than this. I remember that when December 10th, 2010, Marcy was having a heart attack and hours and hours in the hospital, um, left the hospital that night thinking, um, being told by the, by the hospital staff, we don't know if she'll be alive tomorrow. We don't know if she'll survive this. And I remember just that agony and that pain. It wasn't even me, it was my wife. And I just remember seeing and hearing the Lord say to me as I ran to the scriptures, he's saying, I see you, Andrew. I see Marcy. My eyes are on you. And whether she lives or whether she dies, she's mine and you're mine and you can trust me. I see you in your trouble. Trust me. Trust me now. Now is the time to trust. And I remember at that moment as I started to, I was actually reading about Hagar and the fact that God saw Hagar in the wilderness when she cried out to him. I just remember just feeling the the flood of God's relief that because he sees me and because he knows me and because he's promised good things that I can trust him. You see, I think that you need to ask yourself a question. Do I know that I know that I am one of God's people? That is the question. It's not, can I handle the stress? 
It's not, can I make it through this? It's not, what is going to happen? Am I going to wind up with Alzheimer's? You know, my dad has Alzheimer's. Maybe I'm going to have Alzheimer's. It's not, am I going to have breast cancer? It's not, am, you know, are, are my kids, all of these things that can be on us, that can be on our minds, that can be on our hearts. You see, those are not the key question. The key question is, am I God's? Am I secure in Him? Because if I am secure in Him, come what may, I have his promises. You see, if you are not sure that you're one of, God's, one of God's children, if you're not sure that you're one of God's people, you can turn to him in repentance and faith. This is what the gospel is. You turn to Christ, you repent of your sin, and you turn to him and believe. Jesus said that anyone who receives me, all who receive me, all who believe in who I am as Yeshua, the, the Savior of the world, the fact that Yahweh saves, all who believe in me will be called my own. I want to encourage you to repent of your sin and turn in faith to what Jesus did on the cross. And the last one is, I want you to see this. If you do know that you know that you know that you're God's child, I want you to see this. If yes then there's a few things you need to do. If you know that you're his, you need to remember what he said. And that's part of what the sermon is about, and that's part of what every sermon is about, that we are remembering what God has said. That's why you need to be in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. That's why we're doing Wednesday nights. That's why we're doing all that we do, so that we can remember and know what God has said. Not only do we remember what he said, but we live in him. We remember and we live in him. And even this one, fill it in, we die in his promises. Because the life that we die in this world is only a bridge port to the life eternal that has been promised in Christ. So Psalm 121 is all about the security of God's people. And I hope indeed that you have his security. Would you stand with me for prayer?